I want to begin today with a story, a story about the Kruger Park, Olsen's Lager, and a crossbow. <laughs> How do they connect? Well, when I was young in primary school, my parents decided to take us on a holiday, myself and my cousin, to the Kruger Park. And we figured that when one goes to the Kruger, it's best to be armed, just in case you get attacked by some wild beast. So in the lead up to this trip, we constructed these crossbows. And these crossbows were unique. They were made out of planks and broomsticks and elastic bands. And we tested them out at home. And they would shoot split pins. If you don't know what a split pin is, it's a piece of steel that's folded like this. So we would kind of open them a little bit, put them on the crossbow, and then we would shoot anything that moved. Now, it's a long drive from the place where we live to the Kruger Park. So while we had our crossbows with us in the back seat of the bus, we were kind of thinking it'd be good to have some target practice along the way. We weren't sure that it'd be a good idea to open the windows of the bus because we thought we might actually kill someone or something if we shot them. So we looked around the bus for a target, and underneath the seat in front of us was a six-pack of Olsen's Lager. I remember it clearly. And my dad had packed it in there, and it was for him on the holiday. And uh, we kind of had a look at this, put a split pin in our crossbow, and kind of dared each other. Do you think we should shoot the can? Do you think anything will happen? No, it'll never go through. It'll never, it'll never go through. And we, we kind of talked each other up and eventually pulled the trigger. I can't remember if it was him or if it was me or if it was both of us together. We pulled the trigger, and the split pin disappeared straight into the can of beer. And the next thing that happened is all this beer kind of just poured out this little hole, but there was music playing in the bus, so you couldn't, you couldn't hear the sound of it. But what you, what you could do was smell the beer. And we kind of watched anxiously to see if there's going to be any reaction from the front of the vehicle. And all of a sudden, I saw my mom kind of turn her head a little bit and her nose go like... Which of you boys have opened a beer? And I was like, oh boy, now we're gonna be we're gonna be in trouble for underage drinking in the back of the bus. We're like, we didn't open a beer because we didn't. It wasn't telling a lie. But she knew something was up. So she got my dad to pull over and they got us out the bus and they looked what had happened. We explained the story, hoping like they would find, you know, some humor in it, which they didn't. And we got into so much trouble for shooting our crossbow into the can of beer. And they were confiscated, luckily, for the animals in the Kruger Park. And that was the end of our crossbow adventure. But I was thinking about this story this week because uh, we'd, been, we'd seen family and, and we'd been to a game reserve recently, so all these kind of memories connected. But it, it got me thinking about how hindsight is, is so helpful uh, for you to see how what seems like a good idea at the time is actually really not a good idea. But you need hindsight to see that. Uh, anyone of you, you've, you've done something, you've thought something. At the time, it seems like this is the best idea ever. And as you go through with it and it passes and you look back and you realize that wasn't such a good idea after all. The hindsight does that for us. And perhaps you sit here today in hindsight of your life and you look back and there are some things that you've done or some decisions that you've made that are really good decisions and then there are others which are really bad decisions. So if I were to ask you, if you were to reflect on your life until this point, would you... Decisions that are good outweigh the ones that are bad. I mean, if you think of your life in this kind of scale, and, and this bucket over here represents everything that you've done well, all your good decisions, uh, everything that you've crushed, and, and this side is all the things that you've done badly, all the bad decisions, all your regrets, all your failures, where would it be? Would you, would you kind of feel outweighed that you, the summary of your life so far is the negative outweighs the positive, or would it be, no, you know, I'm actually a relatively good person? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever ranked yourself on a scale of I'm, I'm good or I'm bad? And perhaps you, you compare yourself to others and you say, well, I'm not that good. Like, I'm not as good as Nelson Mandela or Mother Teresa. I'm not that good, but I'm better than Hitler. Because <laughs> if I were to rank him, he would, he would be like all the way down there and someone who's really good there. I'm just, I'm just, kind, of, I'm just kind of in the middle. Where would you put yourself? Have you ever thought about this? Are you a good person or a bad person? The sum of your life, decisions, events, actions, does it put you in the good category or the bad category? And uh, how do you actually define what is good because what's good for me might be bad for you and vice versa. So, but, but we tend, I find, to rank ourselves on this scale of I'm a good person 
or I'm a bad person. And you hear this come through in language. People will say, well, you know, I, I'm just trying to do the best I can in life and be a good person and make wise decisions and do things well. And, and we kind of ha have this, this underlying thought about good and bad in our lives. So we begin a new series today called The God Questions. And we've asked you for some input on what are the questions that you would like to ask God. The questions that you've wrestled with, the things that you are, are uncertain of, the, the things that you, you would love to have an answer to this question. And we asked you to share those questions. And we've got a whole bunch of, of really brilliant and difficult to answer questions. And over the next few weeks, we're going to unpack and try to address some of them. And there's questions around all kinds of things, questions around faith and suffering and homosexuality and, and all kinds of different things. And if you have a question and you would like to ask that, maybe for some of the youth, some of the younger people in the room, you, you want to know some things about faith, you put it on the inbox form and drop it in the box, and we'd love over the next few weeks to get someone else up here to answer your questions, because I'm just going to do the first one today. <laughs> the first one, the first one is, is this, is, is why do good people go to hell? Why do good people go to hell? <laughs> We're trying to lighten the mood a little bit in here. <laughs> You, you, I, I don't know if it's the weather or what it is or the, the series. You guys are really quiet today. You know that? Is it me? Is it, you're wondering what's going to happen. All these things around here. Just relax, relax. Church is meant to be enjoyed. Trusting God is going to do something in your heart today as we unpack this question about why do good people go to hell? Another way that you could phrase this question could be um, why do... Uh, I wrote some other options down here. If, if God is love, how could he send people to hell? Maybe you've had that question before. Maybe you ask it yourself. If you're trying to reconcile the goodness, the compassion, the mercy of God with sending people to this, this fiery place, this lake of fire. Or perhaps another way to ask the question is, why do people who are good but not saved, in other words, who don't follow Jesus, they have another belief system, another religion, how can those people, although they're good, why did they go to hell? So whichever way you may like to ask the question, the, the point may be in, not in the words specifically, but there's some underlying themes here about hell and, and good people and the decision process of how these people might end up in hell. And uh, to be able to answer this question, we have to acknowledge first that there are some assumptions we've got to make or some assumptions behind this question. And the first assumption is that hell exists and it is a place to go to. So the very fact that we're saying, well, why do good people go to hell at some level, we've got to believe then that hell is a place and it's possible for people to go there. The other assumption is that there is some kind of standard of good and bad. What is that standard and who gets to decide what is good and bad? Because good is very subjective. What's good for one person may be bad for someone else. But there may be some standard of good and bad and... Uh, it may not be the standard by which people or the criteria by which people end up in hell or not. So if we were to say people are good, but good people can still go to hell, then maybe the criteria to go to hell or not go to hell may not be to do with good and bad at all. And the other assumption we've got to make is someone, somewhere, there's some process or some decision formula of how people get to hell or not. I would like to try to unpack some or help you see perhaps some biases that you may have even at a subconscious level. At least I've seen these in my life and I'm guessing if you anything like me, you may have these the same. And you may not vocalize them or express them in this way, but as I talk about them, I want you to reflect and think, do I actually believe something like this? Could there be something at some level where I believe something in line with this? And it's really the worldview about what we do in this life and what happens in the next life. And I want to encourage you right up front to pay attention to this because the question I have for you is, do you want to risk your eternity on some vague thought and something that you're not really sure about and you're kind of just waiting, well, let's see what happens? <laughs> or will you take responsibility for your own spiritual growth and take this and wrestle with it and see what does the Bible actually teach about this? Because I, for one, don't want to risk my eternity on some fluffy idea. So the, the bias that we may have goes something like this. Let's imagine that this is the timeline of your life. And at some point, does anyone want to give their birth date? 
No, no one did. Okay, we'll just say this is day zero for you, whatever your birthday is. No one wants to give their age away in the room. I heard one date, but no year attached to that. So this is, the, this is the day that you were born, day zero. And then this over here, this is the day when your time on earth is done. So I'm definitely not going to put a date on this. But what I will do is just put the rest in peace. <laughs> That's the end of your life on this earth. Now, in between, what many of us want to do between the day we're born and the day when our time on this earth is finished, what we want to do generally is try to be as good a person as possible. For the most of us, not all of us are like that, but for the most of us, generally what we want to try and do is, is from this point until this point is we want to do good and we want to be good and we want to do good things. And why is it that we want to do that? Well, perhaps it's because we have this idea or this thought that when we reach this point, we're going to engage with someone or something who's going to tell us how we've lived our life. And based on that, they're going to tell us, do we get to go to heaven or do we get to go to hell? Does this sound familiar to anyone? Like there's some thought, we're not quite sure how it's going to work, but we anticipate that one day when we pass from this world into the next world, there's going to be some kind of decision criteria which, based on what we've done here, will determine what happens next. And uh, if you think about your life, now reflect, we're doing a lot of reflection today, but if you reflect on your life and, and you think about some of the memories that you have, perhaps one of the first memories that you have from childhood is... Um, is I, I don't know how far back you can remember, but generally for most of us, there will be a moment that you can remember where you got into trouble for something. You, you did something. You, you, you told a lie to your parents, or you, told, you stole something, or you had a big fight with one of your friends or something, and there were some kind of actions ingrained in your memory which kind of goes into the, into the bucket of negative things. But then there was a moment in your life where, where you remember being kind to someone. Maybe there was a new kid at school, and you were the one who initiated the action to go and make them feel welcome, and, and that's a good thing. And then maybe as you got older, I don't know, maybe you guys can help me out here with some, some stories from your life. Anyone want to share anything? You, you got to high school, and, and you hung out with some people that your parents may not have approved of, and they encouraged you to, to try some things. And you'd said when you were growing up, like, I'm never going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And then you hung out with these people, and over time, you, you kind of began to compromise on the things that you had said. And, and you... you you drank something or you took something and, and you knew your parents weren't going to be happy about that. So you kept quiet about it and keeping things in the dark. Well, that's not good at all. And then, and then maybe it was something bigger. It was something like maybe you decided you, you're going you're to stay a virgin until you get married. But something happened and, and you, you compromised on that, on those value system. And you, it left you kind of feeling broken and, and dirty. And you began to see yourself as a bad person because of the t decisions you made. And if at that point in your life someone said to you, are oh, you a good person or a bad person, you would look at your decisions and actions and the emotions inside you and say, well, actually, I feel like a bad person. And as you got older, things began to change. Maybe you hang out with different people and you thought, you know what, I'm going to start working. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to pay my taxes. And that's a good thing <laughs> for the most part. I'm not going to cheat. Tax avoidance, tax evasion. We can do tax avoidance. That's a good thing. But we pay our taxes. It's good. It's good. And, uh, and, and then you get married, and, and you begin a family, and you're going to try and be a good parent. And these things are all good and, and motivated, but you, you know, motivated by something in you. I'm running out of tennis balls here. I thought I bought enough. You guys have so many stories today. I just can't <laughs> keep up with them. And then, uh, and then something else happened in your life, and, and you had a... You, you had a, one of those... Uh, it happened this morning, actually. The, it's called a five to church. In the car on the way here, you had a five to church with your spouse. You, maybe it's only for people who are carrying something in the meeting this morning, like in the way, you, you know, and, and you, you walk in here and you, you try to pretend like everything is good, but inside, things are not good. I mean, that's not good at all. Right? So you decide, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm going to make some decisions to do good things in my life, so I'm going to start to give money to the church, and that's a good thing. Oh, it's a heavy wallet. <laughs> You know, I need some more coins in there. It's not really balancing things out. And then we kind of hope that one day when this unknown date approaches and we leave this earth, that whatever has happened, it, it, when we get to that point, that someone is going to look at these things and kind of go, well, hey, you've done more good things than bad things. Therefore, you get to go to heaven and you get to avoid hell. 
Or they might say, hey, you've done more bad things than good things, so you, just, you should have tried a little harder because you just missed it just by 10 points that you're going to hell for eternity. You, should, you shouldn't have stolen that thing. You shouldn't have said that. You should, you should have said sorry. I don't know if you've ever watched A Good Place before, yes. but they, they have the afterlife point system where there's, I think it's three billion accountants keeping track of what everyone on earth is doing and assigning values to each action on earth. And they kind of keep these scores together and they, they work out. So when someone passes into the afterlife, depending on their points, they either go to the good place or the bad place. So I'm just, I'm just wondering if, if this is something that we may believe or, or something that we may have, something that you may think, although you may not admit it, but somewhere in, in your belief system, there's something like this. Is what happens next is determined by the decisions I make here. A lot of it has to do with good and bad. So the question is, well, where does this come from? And you probably, at some level, it's from our, our sense of morality, where we want things to be good and we want to do the right thing, again, for the most of us. We want the world to be a better place, so we want to see good prevail. We want to see evil defeated. So there's something in us that wants to pursue doing good over evil. But when it comes to the faith system and what we believe in church, it's helpful to look back at church history. And in the, in, in, just after 300 AD, the guy who was going to become the emperor of Rome, Constantine, he began to work to make Christianity the religion for Rome. For the empire. And he did it as a political move at first. And when he became emperor, it became official. Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire. Just 300 years after these very same Romans had crucified Jesus the Messiah. 300 years go by, and then they go, okay, this is our religion. We're going to worship Jesus the Messiah. And as the Roman Empire began to adopt Christianity, Christianity began to become very institutionalized. And the emperor became the bishop, so Constantine was the first bishop, and, and he had kind of an elevated position within the church, and there was a lot of ceremony around this, and, and the church moved from public houses and homes into specialized buildings, and things happened that we got seats, and, a, and a, what they called an altar, and there was a removal of the bishop from the congregation. And out of this came the Roman Catholics, a belief system, and, and who were the custodians of of church for another, what is it, 1,400 years until the Reformation in the 1700s. And one of the incredible things about this time, in about three, 382, uh, the Bible was translated into Latin, and the Latin Bible became the official uh, scripture of the Roman Catholic Church. And there's a word in there, in Romans chapter 1, and it's the word justification. And this is a little bit nerding out on language, but it's helpful for where we're going and maybe to help us understand why we believe some of the things that we believe. And the word for justification came out of the Roman culture. It's a word for justice made up of two words. The first one is to be declared righteous, and the other one is a process of making. Long story short, this word was understood to be a process whereby God makes someone righteous. It was something that took time, that began at one point, and was a continuous process, justification. And, and the, the doctrine that came out of this is this idea that salvation, the process of coming to God, it begins in a moment of baptism in, within the Catholic Church, and, and some of you are in the Catholic Church or have come from that, and this may sound familiar for you. When you're baptized as an infant, that begins the process of grace in your life. And then what you've got to do through your life, from when, the moment when you're baptized as a young person until the time when you leave this world, what you've got to do is you've got to do good things. And you've got to try at the end of your life to attain a state of grace. And if at the end of your life you are in a state of grace, then you might be saved. But first you have to go to perjury, purgatory, and uh, you've you got, you got to be punished for some of the, things that, some of the bad things that you did. And this, for 1,400 years, was a key doctrine, a core doctrine, which has influenced a lot of what we, how we see things, how we interpret things, is this idea that, okay, I, there's a whole lot of stuff I've got to do so that at the end of my life I attain a heavier value on the good things that I've done rather than negative things. And whatever I've done in my life here is going to impact what happens next. Now, the problem with these biases and these underlying thoughts that we have, the, the thing is, and this is the point, point where I encourage you not to risk on this, but to take responsibility and to dig in. And don't just believe it because I've said it, but because you see it for yourself. This is not what the Bible teaches. 
which is a big problem, yes? For many of us, we, we want to do what Jesus did and, and said and live by that, and so we've got to understand, well, what does the Bible actually teach about this life and what comes next? If we, to answer the question about good people going to hell. So I want to share some ideas with you. I want to give you a couple of thoughts around this. And the first kind of correction, if we can put it that way, is to think about righteousness instead of good. So we use the word good. Do good people, well, good people go to hell. Could we use the word righteous instead? Righteous. So what is righteous? Righteous is who God is. It's upright. Everything is right. He's holy. He's just. We saw last week, justice and mercy. He's compassionate. He's fully righteous. He's perfect. He cannot tolerate sin. There's no sin in him. This is the idea of righteousness. It's like more than good. This, this is what righteousness is. And, and the problem with using the word good is that good is subjective. But when we use righteousness as a standard that God is righteous, there's no subjectiveness to that, that God is righteous. And here's what the Bible says. This is what Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, when it comes to good. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. The one who understands is the one, and there is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. Super encouraging. How are you feeling? <laughs> no one is righteous. There's no one who's done anything good. Last week we saw in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned. Everybody has sinned. So this, the, the, the point of this, of what Paul writes here, is actually in our lives, this doesn't count for very much. This kind of idea of, of good things versus bad things and, and how do they tally up at the end of my life, this is actually is kind of worthless. Does that mean that you shouldn't do good things? Well, maybe that's another question for another day. But the, the point is, we, we've got to see if, if there's, at some level, this idea that when we connect our faith to the, our actions of, are we doing good, are we doing bad things, is that going to earn me brownie points in the next life? Actually, this is, Paul is saying, this doesn't count for anything because there's no one who's done anything good. No one is righteous. No one. It, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a hard truth. And the thing is, about doing good things, and you know the extent of your brokenness, is you can do good things, but inside there's a whole lot of stuff that's not good. And it's only you that gets to see that. And on the outside, you pretend, like, and Jesus had a lot to say about this, about pretending that you are good by doing good things, but on the inside there's nothing good. And this is the heart of what Paul's getting at here, is there's no one who's got anything good inside of them. And this begins to frame the question, well, will good people go to hell. The first thing we've got to understand is there are no good people. There is no one who's righteous. So let's take that off the table. So we think about righteous rather than good. And the second correction is to think about faith instead of works. So this whole idea of good versus bad, really another way that we could say this, this is about our actions, it's our deeds. I do this and this is good and I do that and that's bad and somehow they're going to tally up at the end is let's set that aside for the moment and let's think about faith instead of works. So if, if we take the scales off the table, the question is, well, how do I attain this righteousness? If no one is righteous, but I need to have righteousness because God is righteous. So if I want to come close to God, I need to be righteous. Otherwise, I'm just going to be consumed by Him because He's so perfect. How do I get that righteousness? And the message of the gospel is that righteous, righteousness, it comes through faith. It doesn't come through works. In other words, it comes through what you believe and not what you do. So the righteousness that we have, actually it comes from the outside. And last week we celebrated Easter and we spoke about Jesus' finished work on the cross. And it, it's by that, by His finished work on the cross, that you and I can take hold of the righteousness of God without doing anything but by putting our faith and trust in Jesus and His work on the cross. This was the revelation, the moment of awakening for Martin Luther in the 1700s, who grew up in the Catholic Church. But one day he was sitting at, in a moment of absolute despondency, and he opened his Bible. And you, you, know, you guys have maybe done this sometimes. You're just like, I'm so desperate, I'm going to play like Bible roulette. And you open your Bible and you read whatever's there. It's just like, yes, God is speaking to me. He did that. He did that. 
and his Bible opened up to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And this is, this is what he read. Paul writing, he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because there is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it, and here we go, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And, and you go, okay, I've heard that before, I get that. But another way to say it is, is like this, the one who is righteous by faith will live. The one who is righteous by faith will live. And here's, if we go back to that Latin word, I was talking about justification, and, and that word that was like a process that begins and carries on, that was the Roman word for justification. What, what Luther did is he read this in the Greek, and the word that is used here for righteous is actually a declaration. It's not a process. It, it's a moment of declaration. Now today we understand justification like that. It's justification is not a process. It's a declaration that you are not guilty. And this is the moment for him where he reconciled. H hang on. This, this process of, of, you know, kind of getting better so that one day you can go to heaven, actually, that's not what the Bible says. This is a technicality in language which has led us to believe that we need to do some things to be okay so that one day we get to go to heaven and avoid hell. And his revelation was this. No, righteousness is a declaration. He actually called it an alien righteousness. In other words, something comes from the outside. It's not something that you do. It's not something that happens to you. It's something that's spoken over you. So when we say, well, righteousness, it comes through faith, what happens when you put your trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross and, and His sacrifice for you and Him coming back to life in the resurrection, and you take a hold of that and you say, I begin to believe this and apply it to my life, what happens? God speaks over you, righteous. You are righteous. Not because of your action, not because of your track record, not because of the good things and the bad things that you've done, but because you put your faith in Jesus and say, Jesus, I can't do this myself. And in that moment, God speaks over you, righteous. And suddenly you have righteousness. This was the revelation for Luther. He went from this, this, this feeling the pressure to perform, to be a certain way, to suddenly, and in his words, and then the gates of paradise swung open and I walked in. And I was filled with the Holy Spirit. The salvation came to him in that moment when you see, actually, this is something that comes from the outside. It's not something that just, you know, that I've got to work towards. So justification is a declaration. It's not a process. And the last thought, Last encouragement is to think, think, about, think about kingdom I instead of destination. So a, a lot of our life, we live like this. We go from here to here so that, so that one day I can go to heaven and avoid hell. The point is not to go to heaven one day. There's a few nervous laughs in the room. Many of us, we live our lives like this. I'm just holding on so that one day I can go to heaven. And we're waiting for this moment where the judge comes and says, well, you made it. Well done, good and faithful servant. You're going to heaven. And like, yes, I've done well from here to here. The point of the Bible story is not that we go to heaven one day. Like there, there's no evacuation idea that all the, you know, all the good people, all the Christians, Jesus is just going to come back and, and take them away from this earth to another place which is somewhere else. And we're not quite sure. Where heaven is, right? Like, where is it? And where's hell? Is it in the middle of the earth? Is heaven up just above the atmosphere? Yuri Gagarin went there and he said, I didn't find your heaven, Christians. So it's not there. Well, where is it? But we have this idea, many of us at some level, we, we, we're living our lives to a destination. I, I want to go to heaven. I want to avoid hell. Th this, is not, this is not the narrative of the whole of Scripture. So I, I want to encourage you to think about it like this, to think kingdom instead. So let's, let's begin here. Let's begin in Genesis. And let's go to Revelation. By the way, if you're new to church, Genesis is the first book in the Bible. Revelation is the last one. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> joking, not joking. What happens in Genesis is we see this picture of kingdom. And in Genesis, we have God and His people, and His people are assigned to rule and reign with God. And the kingdom of heaven overlaps perfectly with the kingdom of earth. And there's unity. And what we see when you flip to the last few chapters of the Bible and Revelation, what you see again is kingdom. 
is God and His people, and God is ruling, and His people are co-ruling with Him. And you can read the Bible like this. You can read it from Genesis to Revelation, and you see the thread of kingdom. It begins with the kingdom of heaven overlapping perfectly on earth, and it ends with the kingdom of heaven overlapping perfectly on earth. So by the way, when you dig into this, what you see is heaven is not somewhere out there. Heaven is actually something that comes here. So when we talk about going to heaven, do you know you actually can't find the phrase, I will go to heaven in the Bible, or I'm going to heaven? It, it's not there. Everything speaks about heaven coming here. So the narrative of Scripture is going from where heaven is here with God and His people to where heaven is here with God and His people. And what you notice in this thread is hell is, is kind of an afterthought. Many of us, I suppose, we underplay the doctrine of heaven and, and overplay the doctrine of hell. And we think at some level like heaven is going to be super boring on the clouds with like harps and robes. <laughs> Yeah, we laugh about it, but it's true. At some level, we, we're like, I'm not even sure if I'm looking forward to heaven, by the way that people think about it. But, but heaven is going to be a place that is absolutely thrilling and exciting. It, it's a place where you do what you're created to do, where, the, where human work in unity and diversity is important and valued. And I think in heaven, we're going we're gonna to get to travel, and we're going to rule and reign, and, and we don't understand that because we haven't got a picture of what dominion is, but with, we're going to be doing what we created to do like it was in Genesis, but better. That's what heaven's going to be like. It's a, it's a new creation. And what happens in the story from Genesis to Revelation is, is kingdom here is overlapping, there's unity, but then man rebels and says, I want my own kingdom. So a fracture happens between the kingdom of heaven and what becomes the kingdom of darkness. And from that moment on, every single one of us, this is why Paul says there's no one good, not even one, because all of us are born into the kingdom of darkness. Because at some level, at the deepest level, we choose our own way. And what God does from this moment in Genesis chapter 3 is he initiates a rescue mission to send his son, Jesus, to come on the cross. And what does Jesus come to do on the cross? He, he doesn't come so that you, you can be forgiven of your sins and, and you know, have a nice life and everything will be okay, and you, can, you don't have to do self-care because Jesus cares for you and all those kind of things. Like, like, that's not why He came. Jesus came to bring the kingdom of heaven back to earth. The kingdom of heaven is the thing that He spoke about the most. When He began His ministry in Matthew chapter 4, He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. And what he did on the cross is he began to inaugurate the kingdom. The kingdom was lost here. And at some level, the kingdom of heaven, it was removed from our earth and what we know. And Jesus comes and he says, I'm bringing the kingdom back. And you and I, we live in this space between where Jesus has come to bring the kingdom back and what's coming when he brings it fully. And, and here's the truth is that Jesus came and he died and he rose again and he will come again. So the story is not finished. And you and I, we live in this place of the now and the not yet, and one day Jesus will come back, and when He comes back, what He's going to do is He's going to bring about the new creation. And, and here, the heavens will be recreated, and the earth will be recreated. It's not this idea that everything's just going to disappear and we go somewhere else, but actually everything is recreated here, and heaven comes to earth. And, and this is the moment, this is the moment where, where we go, well, okay, but what about that hell thing? Like, how does that fit in? As best as we can tell, and, and honestly, and you can go, look, the Bible doesn't say that much about hell. And we make a big thing about it. The Bible makes a lot about heaven, makes a big deal about the, the kingdom of heaven, the invitation that you have into the kingdom. But when it comes to hell, there, there's a couple of passages in the Old Testament that speak about fiery judgment. It's like a metaphor. There, there's a judgment of fire. Jesus talks about hell in the New Testament seven or eight times, and every time he does, he talks about this place called Gehenna, and in our English translations, we read the word hell. Gehenna is a place outside of Jerusalem where child sacrifices used to happen, and it's kind of, it's a picture of desolation and sorrow and lack of purpose and hurt and pain and suffering. It's something outside of the city wall. It's a metaphor that he uses. And, and then the, what we have in the end of Revelation is, is this this message about the lake of fire. And this is really the only time where something is mentioned about hell, the lake of fire. And it says, and, and up at that point, Hades, the grave, will empty out. And by the way, if you read through your Old Testament, you see the word hell there. Generally, it's been mistranslated from the grave or Hades or Sheol. And, and Revelation says, and the grave, Hades, will empty its contents, give up its contents into the lake of fire. And from these ideas, we put together this picture like, 
the, you know, there's this big fiery pit. And I don't know, it might be a fiery pit, but the point is it's not a mega theme. Heaven is the mega theme, not hell. So we live our lives not to go to heaven one day, not to avoid heaven one day, but actually to step into the kingdom that Jesus has brought now. So see it like this, is both heaven and hell are both current and future realities. It's not something that we wait for our time on this earth and then we find out, are we going to heaven or are we going to hell? Actually, it's a decision you make right now. And when you put your faith in Jesus, you step into the kingdom of heaven and that's your trajectory for eternity. Heaven begins now. And if you willfully reject the gospel and the grace of Jesus Christ, then your trajectory to hell begins now. So what is hell? Well, well hell really is a place with no plot, no storyline, eternal boredom, a disconnection from God. And we often ask this question, well, how can God, if God is love, how can he send people to hell? Friends, God doesn't send anyone to hell. The people that are going there choose to go there because they willfully reject over and over again the invitation to be part of the kingdom of heaven. And if you think about it at the deepest level, for true love to exist, there has to be the possibility that it gets rejected. And therefore, hell must exist for those who choose to reject the goodness of God. Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, this guy, he comes to ask Jesus about the very things that we're talking about. And maybe as we close, I can uh, ask you to stand as I read this. And we'll finish with this, this passage and then just a couple of thoughts. So just then, someone came up and, and asked Jesus, Teacher, doesn't this sound familiar? Teacher, what good must I do to have this eternal life? Jesus, what, what good things must I do so I can go to heaven one day? And Jesus, he always asks a he answers a question with a question. Uh, when we were prepping this series, we thought about this. Hey, maybe we should ask you for questions and then just ask you questions because that's what Jesus does. Why do you ask me about what is good? He said to him, there's only one who is good. So if you want to enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. And we can misread that and say, well, Jesus is saying the way to eternal life is to keep the commandments. What he's actually doing is just making a bigger point here. He's getting the guy to see something that even if you keep your, all the commandments, it's still not good enough. Because here's what he says, well, uh, which ones, he asked Jesus, and Jesus answered, well, don't murder and don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't do all the things that end you up in, in the negative bucket, uh, don't be a false witness, honor your father and your mother, love your neighbor as yourself. I, I've kept all of these. On the outside, the young man told him, what is it that, what is it that I still lack? And Jesus said, well, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be righteous, if you want to take a hold of eternal life, then go and sell your belongings and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and, and follow me. And when the young man, when he heard that, he went away very sad. He was grieving because he had many possessions. And the point of this conversation, Jesus wasn't trying to get the guy to do more good things, trying to keep the commandments. The point of the story is that Jesus was showing him that there, there was something else in his heart that had his attention, that had his focus, where his trust was. There was something that he felt like he couldn't live without. And th this is what Jesus was getting at. Th there's something in your heart where you're trusting in your own wealth, where you're trusting in your own stuff, where you're trusting in your own righteousness to see you through one day into eternity. And the message of Jesus is, if you want to take hold of this righteousness, if you want to step into eternal life, then, then you've got to deal with the things in your heart that are holding you back from giving yourself fully to me. And for some of you in this room, that, that might be finances. I mean, you say, well, you know, I, I'm a good person. I, just, I try to do all the good things, but your heart is not fully given to Jesus because there's a part of you that trusts in something else for your security, for your comfort, for your salvation. It could be a whole list of things but jesus is saying will you trust in me fully 
And the invitation to you is to step into this kingdom, to be part of this kingdom, to give yourself fully to Jesus. And a kingdom is really this. It's not a place. It's not somewhere out there. The kingdom of heaven is not up in the clouds somewhere. The kingdom of heaven is where God's will is done. It's a dimension. And you have the choice to, to comply with the perfect good will of God or to choose your own way. And heaven and hell, both current and future realities. And the choice is yours as to which trajectory you choose for your life. So never think that one day you're going to go to heaven, but see it like this. Today I make a decision. I step into the kingdom of heaven now, and it becomes fuller and fuller into eternity. And one day Jesus is going to come back, and I'm going to experience it in its fullness. But right now, I can begin to experience that peace and that joy and that freedom and that forgiveness. And I can, I can be part of God's plan to see his kingdom come on earth, and I can be a conduit, a vessel to, to bring others into this kingdom. Well, how do we do that? Well, Paul said in Romans 10, the, the way, the way in, the door into the kingdom is that, that you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. You believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you confess with your mouth that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. And we read that lightly and go, well, it's easy to believe that and, and to say that. But at that time, Paul was writing into the midst of the Roman Empire where Caesar was king. And if anyone so much as thought that there was another king as Caesar, they would be sentenced to death. So what Paul is saying is, hey, the, the way that you, if you want to follow Jesus, this, this is your confession. I'm willing to die for the confession of my faith. I will confess with my mouth that Jesus is the king and not Caesar. It's a big ask. But this is the way into the kingdom. And perhaps there are some of you in this room today who need to make some decisions and to make right with God and say, Jesus, I, there's some things in my heart that I need to lay down and I need to get rid of because I don't want to be like this rich long, young ruler who does everything right, but there's a part of me that's not given to you. But I want to give myself fully to you too, so that I can be in this kingdom that stretches from now into eternity. Would you close your eyes for a moment? And if that resonates with you, if there's something in your heart that you feel that you've been holding back from Jesus, this is the moment. And I'd love to pray a prayer with, with you, a prayer over you. And it simply goes like this. Jesus, I, I give you my life. And Jesus, I take your life. And Jesus, today I step into the, your kingdom. And if that's, if that's you, would you just raise your hand up real quick. There's... Jesus, you see our hands that are raised in this room. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing in our hearts, Holy Spirit. And I pray that you, you honor the response of our hearts to you, of laying down things that are holding us back. And, and maybe those things are, are finances. Maybe those things are other things that are taking the attention, the focus of our hearts. And we've been living a life where we feel like we've just got to do better. We've just got to try harder. We've just got to do one more thing. But in this moment, we lay everything down. And we pray these words. Jesus, I give you my life. And Jesus, I receive your life. And today I step into your kingdom. And I pray that you would use me as part of your plan to bring your kingdom fully on this earth. Jesus, I love you. I thank you for your grace and mercy. And I ask for your forgiveness of trying to do things for myself up until this day. I thank you, Jesus, for your abundant life. Amen.